So John chapter 4 is where we're going to be in our Bible study this morning. If you're new to Cornerstone, we are making our way through the whole Bible, and we're here through the Gospel of John. We just started it a few weeks ago, and so we're looking into chapter 4 today. So John chapter 4. I'm going to start reading at verse 1. It's a little bit of a lengthy story, but I want you to see this precious conversation that Jesus has with an unnamed woman in this story. She's known as the woman at the well or the Samaritan woman. And so it's John chapter 4. I'm going to start reading at verse 1. Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, that's John the Baptist, Verse 2, though Jesus himself did not baptize, but his disciples, okay? Uh, Note that. Jesus didn't baptize anybody. His disciples did the baptizing. Why is that important, by the way? Side note, because can you imagine if you had been baptized by Jesus and someone else was baptized by, say, Andrew? (laughs) Well, I was baptized by Jesus, you know, la-di-da. And so Jesus didn't baptize anybody. His disciples did. Verse 3, he left Judea. And departed again to Galilee, but he needed to go through Samaria. And so he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. And Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. And then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. And Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. And the woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as well as his sons and his livestock? And Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. And the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. And Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, you have well said, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. In that you spoke truly. The woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. (laughs) Yeah, I guess, I guess so, right? He He just read her mail and she's like, okay, I think you're a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. And Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship, we know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. And when he comes, he will tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Jump down to verse 39. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified. He told me all that I ever did. And so when the Samaritans had come to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his own word. And then they said to the woman, now we believe not because of what you said, for we ourselves have heard him, and we know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. Let's pause and pray. God, help us now as we open up your word to hear and receive what you want us to to glean from this story. What a wonderful story, Lord. And we pray that we would insert ourselves here to to see that you could have been having this conversation with any one of us. And oh Lord, how you met this woman, her need on a level that she had never understood before. Thank you, Lord. Bless this time in your word, we pray in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Last week in our Bible study, we were in John chapter 3, 
and we looked at a conversation only recorded in John's Gospel between Jesus and Nicodemus. And Nicodemus was a Pharisee. He was a man of the Jewish ruling council. He was well-educated, well-respected, with high social standing among the Jewish people. Today, we look here in chapter 4, and it is also a conversation that is only recorded in John's Gospel. But this time, it is between Jesus and a Samaritan woman. And she is quite the opposite of Nicodemus. She is a woman. She is not Jewish. Uh, she didn't belong to any respectable group. In fact, her lifestyle made her quite the social outcast. And I love the way that John records these two conversations. Again, he's the only one who does. And he puts these conversations back to back because it shows to us just how compassionate, how relatable, how approachable Jesus was to both the high class, educated, respected upper echelons of society like Nicodemus, but also the lowly, broken, rejected outcasts of society like this Samaritan woman. This is a beautiful the way that, that Jesus can relate to all people. Now, we don't know her name. This woman is unnamed in the story. We just uh, know that she's a Samaritan, and we know a little bit about her life from the course of the conversation. So let's back up and look at this story together, starting in verse 3. In verse 3, it says, Jesus left Judea and departed again to Galilee. And so what we learn in John chapter 2 is that Jesus has been in Jerusalem for the Feast of Passover. But that's not the home base for his ministry. Home base for his ministry was up in the Galilee region, up in Capernaum. And so he is leaving, it tells us here at the beginning of this story, he's leaving the region of Judea where he's been in Jerusalem, and he's making his way back north to Capernaum where the home base is for his ministry. Now, for you visual people like me, I put together a little map so we can just kind of orient ourselves. So here's a map of Israel. You have the Sea of Galilee to the north. You have the Dead Sea to the south. The Jordan River connects the Sea of Galilee to the Dead Sea and that serves as the eastern border for the nation of Israel. And Jesus is presently uh, having um, worshipped for Passover in Jerusalem, and he's heading up north back to Capernaum, his home base of ministry. So we're talking 85, 90 miles. And this is all on foot, friends. So he's about ready to make this journey. He's leaving Jerusalem. And these cities are within provinces. Like today we would think of counties. We're like Loudoun County and then Leesburg is within Loudoun County. In a similar way, there were provinces. And the province to the south where Jerusalem was was the province of Judea. The province to the north was the province of Galilee. And smack dab in the middle between these two is the province of Samaria and the town of Sychar. That's where this story takes place. Jesus is on his way back north from Jerusalem, and it tells us in verse 4, but he needed to go through Samaria. Now, look at that. He needed to go through Samaria. Did he? Did he need to? Did he need to go through Samaria? Fact of the matter is that almost all Jews avoided Samaria. You made pilgrimage to and from Jerusalem, wherever you might be. If you had to go through Samaria, you would circumvent it. You wouldn't want to have contact with Samaritans. You would go around Samaria. The fact that it tells us here Jesus needed to go through Samaria tells us something. He's got a divine appointment here. He's got a divine appointment with this woman, and this woman has a divine appointment with Jesus, and she doesn't know anything about this. His whole purpose, the whole purpose of Jesus going through Samaria, which, by the way, he never avoided because he's approachable and touchable and real and relatable and loves all people. But the sole purpose on this particular journey that he needs to go through Samaria is to have this conversation with this dear woman that it's going to change her life. And it's not only going to change her life, it's going to change many lives of the, of the town of Sychar. And here we are centuries later, still reading this story. It's going to change some of your lives. This is a relatable true story that is as relevant today as it was in the first century. 
and read it that way. I encourage you to read it that way. Now, the reason why almost all Jews avoided the region of Samaria and thus, by extension, avoided any contact with Samaritans was because there was a long-standing animosity and hostility between Jews and Samaritans. There, there was deep prejudice here. It, it, you, you just simply have to call it that. It was prejudice, and why? About 700 years before Christ, the Assyrian Empire came and besieged Israel. When they did, they took some of the Jews captive and deported them back to Assyria. We're talking today modern Iran. They deported a bunch of Jews back to Assyria, and they imported a bunch of Assyrians into the new land of Israel that they had just conquered. Because the Assyrians typically would do that. Would do that. They, would, they would deport some of the citizens of that country, and they would import their own citizens to repatriotize the new land that they had conquered to make it a little more Assyrian. This is what they did 700 years before Christ. The Assyrians come, conquer the land, deport some Jews, import some Assyrians, and the Assyrians intermarry with the Jewish people that had not been deported. And their children, born to those intermarriages, are Samaritans. They settle in this region of Samaria. And thus, these people are neither Jewish, the descendants of this intermarriage, they're neither Jewish nor are they really Assyrian. They're a, a new uh, uh, ethnicity that emerges from the joining of these two different races and so thus come about the Samaritan people. So the Jewish people never accepted them. You're not fully Jewish. The Assyrian people never really accepted them. You're not fully Assyrian. Here they are, a unique group of people, the Samaritans, that don't really have a personal identity because of the mixture of the Assyrians and, and the Jewish race. Because they were a mixed race, they adopted a mixed religion. They adopted some of the things of the Jews, but not all of the things. For example, the Samaritans believed then and now in the first five books of the Old Testament, what we call the Pentateuch, what Moses was inspired to write. But they did not accept, do not accept the rest of the Old Testament. They don't accept the Psalms, they don't accept the prophets. They accept the first five books only. Also, the Samaritans would practice some of the Jewish feasts, but not all, and they would kind of adjust and modify the celebration of the Jewish feasts. In addition, they weren't allowed to worship in Jerusalem. They were considered half-breeds. That's the way the Jews, in a disparaging way, referred to them. You're not coming to Jerusalem to worship with us. And thus, the Samaritans built their own temple on Mount Gerizim, which is there in the region of Samaria. And in addition, they changed some of the biblical stories to fit their narrative. They said the Garden of Eden was on Mount Gerizim. It wasn't. They said Noah's ark rested on Mount Gerizim. It didn't. They said that Abraham offered his son Isaac on Mount Gerizim. That isn't true either. But they started to kind of modify, adjust, adapt. They took some of the Jewish stuff. In Jesus' day, the population of Samaritans estimated to be around one million people. You know the population of Samaritans today still living in that region? Not a million, only about 800 people total because they were a closed community. They would only marry within their own community. They would only interact within their own community predominantly. And thus, it's only about 800 people in totality today in that region. Here is a picture of some Samaritan men on Mount Gerizim who were celebrating Shavuot. That is, Shavuot is the, is the Jewish uh, feast of Pentecost or, or, or weeks. It's coming up on our calendar here uh, soon. And so they're, they're gathered on Mount Gerizim to celebrate that feast, uh, just like the Jews do. <laughs> By the way, I mean, it, it kind of, in honesty, it looks like a Shriners Convention, but that's the way they dress, <laughs> that's the way they look. So there they are. Kind of a unique thing, they speak Arabic. They speak Arabic because they live in a Palestinian territory. What is Samaria called today? The West Bank. 
So they, they speak Arabic, they identify with the Palestinian culture, but yet their worship identifies with the Israeli Jewish culture. In fact, they speak Arabic in general in everyday practice, but on the days of worship, they go into a synagogue that they have, and they speak Hebrew in the synagogue. Samaritans today carry identification cards that are both Israeli and Palestinian. They can kind of freely flow uh, between the different territories from the West Bank into Israel and back and forth, and, and, and the Gaza Strip and back and forth. So th they have some freedoms, and in fact, their names, the names of, of uh, Samaritans are both Jewish and uh, Arabic names, Hebrew and Arabic names. So it's, it's interesting mixture even today, even though their population is very few. So I wanted to give you all that background because this is the story related to a woman who belongs to a unique group of people who by and large Jews did not associate with, talk with, and, and were prejudiced towards, and vice versa. Well, as the story goes on, it tells us here that on their way to Galilee from Jerusalem, that Jesus and his disciples stopped to take a break. You know, you're walking like 85, 90 miles, you need to take a break. They stop in Sychar because there's a well there. You know, fresh water is a precious commodity. They stop in Sychar, there's a well there. And verse 8 says that Jesus' disciples had gone into town to buy food. So they're thirsty, they're hungry. Jesus is left alone at the well here for this uh, divine encounter that's about to happen. Now, I, I find it both funny and sad that it tells us there in verse 8, you know, did all the disciples have to go buy food? Did it take all? It just, it, it feeds the narrative that men are so helpless that it takes 12 guys to go to the grocery store. <laughs> But it's true. I mean, I, I just have to admit, you know, I feel helpless in a grocery store. My wife sends me with a grocery list. Okay, so like example, on the list is like two cans of pineapple. And I'm standing in front of the shelves where the pineapples are, and I'm just like, are these pineapple rings, pineapple cubes, crushed pineapple? I don't know. Is it six ounces, eight ounces, family size? And I'm texting Terry like, what's, what, what's the deal? You know, I don't even know which, which can to pick. Oh, it's, it's, it's the cubed one. It's there right there. It's eight ounces. Like, okay, okay. Tomato paste. Tomato paste, tomato sauce. I don't know the difference. Is this for, for spaghetti or what? I don't know what's going on. OJ, is it high pulp, no pulp, in between? I'm confused. <laughs> My wife one time told me, hey, put on the grocery list ketchup. So I did, and then I couldn't read the rest of the grocery list. <laughs> it's a joke. Come on. You... <laughs> okay. I'm not that dumb, all right? <laughs> I can play that dumb, but I'm not that dumb. So, uh, you know, it's just, I read that, I'm like, did it really take 12 guys to have to go buy the groceries? Yes, it did, okay? They were probably texting Jesus, like, what do you mean by this kind of fish? Okay. <laughs> so here Jesus is all alone at this well, at Jacob's well, and it says in verse 6 that he was weary from the journey. And it tells us also in verse 6, the time, it was the sixth hour. Now that's biblical time for 12 noon. It's 12 noon. And verse 7 says that a woman from Samaria came to draw water. Now this is highly unusual. It's not highly unusual that a woman has come to draw water. That was actually pretty standard in the culture. What is highly unusual is that she's come at 12 noon. Women never came to draw water at 12 noon. Women came to draw water in the cool of the day as the sun was setting. That was typical in that culture. And it was not just something that women would do out of necessity, because everybody needs water, so you're going to go take your watering, you know, containers and get water and lug it home. It was, all, it was not just something essential, it was something social. The women would gather at the end of the day, they'd get caught up on the town news, they'd talk to each other, they would trade recipes, they would probably complain, while they, why are we lugging the water instead of our husbands, you know? But that's what they would do. It was a, time, it was a, a cultural connection. They would gather water and they'd, and they'd gather together and get caught up on life. They'd go typically at the end of the day, in the cool of the day, not at, not at high noon, in the heat of the day. And so, why is this woman coming at 12 noon? The answer is because she wants to avoid the other women. And she wants to avoid the other women because of what we learn about her life 
in the course of this conversation. She's been married five times, and she's living with number six, and she's not married to him. Okay? Now, you, you have that kind of reputation in a small town. These other women of the town don't like her. They see her as loose. They see her as shameful. They have shunned her, no doubt. She, this woman, no doubt, feels ostracized. She has a reputation in town. And so she's become a social outcast. And who knows? I mean, you live in a small town like this, and you've been married five times, and you're on number six, and you're not even married to that guy. There's a good likelihood that one of her previous husbands was one of the other women's husbands. So you think about the awkwardness of going to the well and having to, you know, get the glances and watch the women whispering about you. She's in a place in her life where she's like, no, thank you. I don't want to go hang around people who are going to end up making me feel ashamed. I, I already, she probably already feels like, you know, bad about things and, and no sense in dumping salt on the wound. I don't want to hang around these women. I'm going to go at 12 noon so I don't have this awkwardness of this social interaction here. And what she doesn't realize is that she has a divine appointment with a counselor at 12 noon. And his name is Jesus, Ph.D., pure, holy, and divine. <laughs> and so he's there, and she comes to draw water, I and mean, she's going to get a whole lot more than that. It says in verse 7, as she encounters Jesus, that Jesus looks at her and he says to her, give me a drink. Now, it was culturally unusual for a man to speak to a woman in public that he was not related to. It was considered not only unusual, but often unacceptable. In addition, what was even more unusual is for a Jew to speak to a Samaritan. You put them both together. You have a Jewish man, Jesus, speaking to a Samaritan woman. This was highly unusual. And she knows this because she first says to him, verse 9, Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you being a Jew ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. And Jesus answered and said to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. And the woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself as well as his sons and his livestock? Okay, now, um, one of the disadvantages of reading your Bible is you, you can't hear tone, inflection, you don't know attitude, you can't see facial expressions or like hands on the hip, but I, I think this is sassy, okay? I think, now I might have to apologize if I see this lady in heaven, but I think this conversation is going sideways right from the beginning, because he says to her, give me a drink. And she says, oh, oh, you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan. Jews don't normally talk to Samaritans. And now fancy you, you don't have a ladle to get the well, well water out. So now you're talking to me, a Samaritan. Jews don't normally talk to Samaritans. You're a man, I'm a woman. What's the deal? <laughs> right? And he says, oh, woman, if you only knew who was talking to you, you'd be asking me for a drink, right? I've got something else that can satisfy you in, in ways that this water will never satisfy you. And then she's like, oh, well, the well's deep. You don't have a ladle, do you? <laughs> you know, that, that's what's happening here. <laughs> and so verse 13, Jesus answered and said to her, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. And the woman said to her, sir, said to him, sir, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. Now, what starts out as perhaps sassy with an attitude has softened now because he has said something that has sparked her curiosity. You got water that I can drink? And I won't be thirsty again. I don't have to come drawing water out of this well anymore. Now, she's thinking physical thirst, right? She's thinking physical thirst. And he's talking about quenching something that is deeper within her. He's talking about bringing satisfaction to her heart in ways that nothing and no one else can. Little does she understand that. He's not talking about physical thirst and quenching physical thirst. He's talking about something that he offers, that only he offers, 
that can quench the deepest longing of the human heart. And so that's the direction he starts to go. He's about to perform meticulous heart surgery with this woman. Because he wants you to understand, I'm talking about your heart, lady. I'm talking about the deepest longing of your heart. And so in verse 16, Jesus says to her something that sounds like it's out of left field, but it's not because he's going to get literally to the heart of the matter. And he says in verse 16, why don't you go call your husband and then come back? I mean, up to this point, all they've been talking about is water and wells and Jacob and Jews and Samaritans. And Jesus all of a sudden says, you know what, why don't you just call your husband and come back and we'll have this conversation. And she says, I don't have a husband. And he says, right, you are that you don't have a husband. The fact of the matter is you've been married five times and the guy you're living with right now, number six, you're not married to. Right? You talk about laying her wide open here, cutting her heart open, surgically exposing what is going on in her life in one statement by the divine inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Jesus just cuts through the fluffy chit chat about wells and water and and Jacob and Jews and Samaritan. And he says, you know what the issue is, dear lady? It's your heart. And what I have to offer you will quench you in a way that nothing else can, especially this this water here. This isn't going to satisfy the kind of thirst I'm talking about. The longing of your heart. You're right. You don't have a husband. You've been looking for love, haven't you? I mean, think about this. What do you think is the greatest need for this particular woman, but for anybody who's been married five times and living with number six, what do you think is the greatest longing of her heart? What is it? Love. She wants to be loved. She wants to be loved. And yet, the truth is that she's looking for the kind of love that no earthly man can satisfy. She needs something deeper than just a romantic relationship with a husband. There's a deeper longing in the soul of every single one of us. And she has this need that she's tried to get filled by relationships with various men that will never be able to be satisfied because they can't give her what only Jesus can. Listen, God has given us human relationships as a wonderful gift. Human relationships of friendships, human relationships like marriage. God has given us those things to complement our lives, not to complete us. Do you know that the only one who can complete us is Jesus? I want to give a word to you who are married. If you're married, stop saying My wife completes me. Stop saying my husband completes me. I know what you mean, but it's not true. Your husband and your wife cannot complete you. And if you think that he or she can, you will always be glomming onto them to try to get something within you satisfied they cannot meet. It can only really be ultimately met by Jesus. And what does that say if you think that? What does that say about single people? They're not complete until they get married. They're only half a person. They're not really complete or whole. No, no. See, this is why we need to change our vernacular. You're not complete because you got married. You're not complete because you have a best friend. Friends complement us. Spouses complement us. Their strengths complement our weaknesses, vice versa. It's complementary. But the only one who completes us is Jesus Christ our Lord. Know that. Only he can meet the deepest needs and longings of the human heart. And when we don't find it in him, when we don't find the deepest needs satisfied in Jesus, you know what we end up doing? Just what this woman did. We go from one relationship to another. Or we go from one drink to another. Or we go from one drug to another. One sexual encounter to another. You name it, we will look in multiple directions trying to either medicate or placate a need in our heart that only Jesus can satisfy. We are the woman at the well. You see this? Every single one of us 
has a hole in our heart that only Jesus can fill. And every single one of us, before we come to know Jesus, has gone in search of something that can medicate or placate that need until we get to the bottom of ourselves and then we realize what? We realize, man, I need Jesus. <laughs> I need Jesus in a big way. Because He's put that desire, He has set eternity in the hearts of man. He has put this God-shaped hole in our heart. This is what Blaise Pascal said, the 17th century physicist and, and philosopher. He, he said, quote, there is a God-shaped vacuum or hole in the heart of each man which cannot be satisfied by any created thing, but only by God the Creator made known through Jesus Christ. And that is true. The longing we have for love and acceptance, the longing we have for forgiveness, the longing we have for fulfillment, for wholeness, only comes in Jesus. We are the woman at the well who needs a Savior. And so for those of you who take notes, I'll save you all the note taking today because I only got one point from this whole conversation that Jesus has with a Samaritan woman. Here it is. Only God can meet the deepest needs of the human heart through a relationship with Jesus. That's the point of this conversation that he has here with this Samaritan woman. And so in verse 19, the woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. Now, you read almost any Bible commentary, and I'll tell you what they say right there. When the woman hears what Jesus says, when he cuts right to the heart of the matter, because he looks at the problem of the heart, and he says, you've been married five times, obviously you're searching for love, you're never going to be satisfied or fulfilled, the deepest longing is only I can, all right? Most Bible commentaries say that then her response is, why, well, I perceive you're a prophet. Well, listen, should we worship on Mount Gerizim? That's where our fathers say. You Jews say it's Jerusalem. What's the place to worship? Most Bible commentaries say at that moment she's deflecting the conversation. She's changing the subject. Well, thank you very much that you exposed my heart and my multiple marriages, but frankly, what I want to know is theologically, where's the right place to worship? Is it Gerizim or is it Jerusalem? And most commentaries say that she's deflecting and changing the subject, but I disagree. And I offer you my opinion for whatever it's worth, but here's what I think she's saying. She's just now been exposed, and she's raw, and she's convicted. And I think what she's asking is, because in that day, the way that you made atonement for your sins was through a sacrifice. And she's wanting to know, so where do I go to atone for my sins? Is it Mount Gerizim, where our forefathers say, is the place to worship, or is it Jerusalem, where you Jews say? And you know what Jesus says to her? Neither. You don't need to go to Jerusalem. You don't need to go to Gerizim because God is spirit and you can get right with him wherever you are because the true worshipers worship him in spirit and in truth. That's right. You can be anywhere, anytime and get right with God because he is everywhere all the time. You can get right with him in Gerizim. You can get right with him in Jerusalem. You can get right with him driving down the freeway. You can get right with him on a Sunday morning at Cornerstone Chapel. It doesn't matter. Because God is spirit. And he's looking for a relationship that people want with him. You can be anywhere, anytime, because God is everywhere all the time. And this is why Jesus says there in verse 21 to 24, he said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. It's come through the Jews, come through a Jewish Messiah. But the hour is coming and now is when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is spirit. And those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. And so the woman says to Him in verse 25, I know that Messiah is coming who is called Christ. When He comes, He will tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am He. I'm the one you've been looking for. I'm the one you've been searching for. I'm the one who can satisfy every longing in your heart. This is one of the rare times when Jesus reveals himself that he doesn't mind someone going and telling other people. She runs right back into town and she says to everybody, come meet a man who told me everything I ever did. Well, instantly this implicates half the men of the town, right? <laughs> so the, everybody's like, what? Told you everything you ever did? Does he know about me? You know, and so... What's interesting here is then they invite Jesus to stay, the story says, for two more days, 
And many in that town believe in Jesus, not vicariously through the woman's testimony, though her life is changed and now they can see they've been drawn to Jesus because of her story, because of her testimony. But they say there in verse 42, they said to the woman, now we believe not because of what you said, for we ourselves have heard him and we know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. Do you know him that way? Because the deepest longing of your heart can be satisfied in Jesus, guarantee you. Many of us have gone in search of many different things trying to fill that longing. And it can only really be filled in a relationship with Jesus. I invite you to trust him today. See yourself like that woman who approaches him. Jesus gets right to the heart of the matter. And he says the The heart of the problem is the problem of the heart. Let's pray today. I invite you to receive him as your Lord and Savior. Father, we thank you for this story because it is a good reminder or new information perhaps for some for the first time that every single one of us have deep needs and longings of the heart that really only you can satisfy. And so, Lord, I pray right now that you would Open the eyes of the hearts of people who need you today. People who have gone in search of many different things, trying to medicate or placate that deep need. Today, I pray, God, that you would meet that need and satisfy the deepest longing of their heart. For people who don't know you, Lord, I pray they would be willing to trust you today, like this woman in the story. Her very first encounter with you, and she opens her heart to receive you as Messiah. Because you touched a nerve in her heart She just wanted to be loved. And you showed her for the first time what true love is. That no man could satisfy, but you could. And there are people here today in a similar situation, Lord. They've turned to people or vices or different things, trying to to be satisfied inside and nothing's working. So today's the day, Lord, I trust you're going to Reveal yourself to them, and they're going to trust you. I'm going to pause in my prayer right now. I'm going to invite you with your heads bowed and eyes closed to just open your heart to Jesus today, to receive him as your Lord and Savior. If you don't know him, I invite you to pray this prayer with me. I'm going to lead in a prayer, and I invite you to just pray it as I'm praying it. You can pray it right where you're seated. Whisper it with me. Just say, Lord Jesus, thank you that you love me so much. You would come to earth and die on a cross for my sins. Forgive me of my sins, Lord. Fill the emptiness of my heart today. I've tried to satisfy that emptiness with many things, relationships, different vices. But Lord, today I recognize only you can fill me up. So I come thirsty and I say, Lord, quench the deepest longing of my heart. Save me today. Fill me with your presence. I surrender to you as Lord and Savior. Come into my life and save me and make me whole like nothing else and no one else can. I trust you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen and amen. Listen, before you leave, I want to invite you, if you prayed that prayer, there'll be a pastor down front here to give you a Bible. If you want just a free Bible, no strings attached, just to remember today's decision. You who prayed it online can get a Bible too. We'll mail you one if you text us at 703-844-9969. Praise God for His grace. Amen? Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Have a great day.